We're back? We are back. To you, the people. All right, cool. Well, there was a comment, I can't remember if it was the last one or the one previous, uh, Tanya. She's like, oh my gosh, how have I missed this series? Uh, so she's just discovering uh, conversations we've been having. Here we are, 16 episodes in. Uh, <laughs> Hi, Tanya. <laughs> yeah, and uh, for those of you, hey, if this is your first episode, welcome. Uh, you got lots to go back through if you feel inspired and have the time. But uh, Blaine and I, we get together every week and uh, we just have a chat. So it's uh, wild wisdom and storytelling with the herbal elder, elder uh, Blaine and Drusik. And I know I am guilty, and I think Malcolm is maybe a little bit too, that we segue around like crazy. Yeah. We're, um, but that's what makes it interesting, right? But, um, yeah. But we usually make our way home. Yeah, for sure. I used to tell people if I was starting a new class, I'd ask, has everybody here been fishing at least once? And people would kind of look around the room and people would be nodding. I said, so you know how you cast out and then you reel in? So if you ever realize I've gone so far out on a tangent that I don't even know where I am anymore, that's how you tell me. Just give me the fishing reel sign and yeah. I'll go, oh, yes, and I'll get off the segue and back to where I'm supposed to be. Yeah, but uh, that's what made your classes interesting, right? And, uh, you know, and based upon our last conversation where we kind of drew this analogy between herbalism and music, uh, one of my favorite bands is the Grateful Dead uh, because they, they go off on musical tangents. The, no show is ever the same. They don't ever perform a song the same. Uh, they, you know, they allow that improvisation and, uh, and it's exciting. You know, the, the crowd gets excited when like one song morphs into another, adventures into this territory yep. and it's like, and then they come back in full circle and it's like, oh. And that's what made, it made it worthwhile to go to live Right? Performances when yeah. you could. And not only worthwhile to go to live performance, but literally the idea of a deadhead is people would follow the band around, you know, like, you know, tour after tour after tour, uh, concert after concert after concert, and it became this whole, whole culture. Hmm. Yeah. Love the Grateful Dead. Who knew? Yeah. <laughs> are they dead now? Some of them are, you know, Jerry Garcia, the main one, uh, passed, but uh, the other ones, they even had a band called The Other Ones for a while, They're, they were still going, but they did have their final, final, final concert as The Grateful Dead just a couple of weeks ago, and I totally missed it, otherwise I totally would have gone, you know, I think they finished off in San Francisco, naturally, uh, where they started, they had some dates, uh, a couple of dates throughout the U.S., so it would have been would have been magical, but uh, yeah, Bob Weir's still going, Phil Lesh is still going, um, Mickey Hart, yeah. But uh, some of the other band members have have died along the way. But I mean, they started mid '60s, you know, in their right. career. So such is such is life. And uh, I think the youngest people in that band would probably be about ten years older than me. Yeah, ish. Like when I look back to. Well, uh, Bob Weir, he was the youngest in the band. Like, he was still a teenager when uh, he got together with Jerry Garcia and a couple of the others. I think he was, like, 17 or something like that. And yeah, well, a yeah. lot of the music I was listening to growing up, I mean, yeah, they, they, they were just 10 years older than I was kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. During that time. There's a, a documentary that I think I've watched three times now called Once They, they Were Brothers. Right. It's about the whole history of the band. Oh, okay. Yeah, know? yeah. And um, yeah. A, a lot of... Um, there's another one about the... We're supposed to be talking about health issues. Um, <laughs> uh, if you see it come up, it's called uh, Laurel Valley. Oh, Laurel oh, Canyon. Laurel Canyon, yeah. Laurel Canyon. And, right. and it was just, just out of the city a short ways... Yeah, uh, and uh, all sorts of mm -hmm. musicians used to hang out there yeah. and get together one by one. And I didn't realize that some of that music I was listening to in high school, um, like with Crosby, Stills and Nash and Young and uh, all of that crew and uh, Bob Dylan, and, mm -hmm. um, that some of that music was so random, like uh, uh, when Joni Mitchell got involved, she's an Alberta girl. Yeah. And um, they had literally been out shopping in the morning and passing a little uh, used furniture, et cetera, shop. She saw a little vase in the window 
that she decided to bought. And, and that really happened that when they got home that day, um, you know, our house is a very, very, very high house with two cats in the yard. Life used to be so hard, but everything is easy because of you, that one. Yeah. Um, so I'll light the flower fire while you put the flowers in the vase that I bought today. She wrote it that night. Right. No, you I, know, it was that instant, yeah. you know, that. Cool. Yeah, real, it was real life stuff for them. I believe uh, Ron Teagarden from Dragon Herbs lives in Laurel Canyon. Still? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got two of his herb shops, and if anybody has known him, a company called Dragon Herbs. He's written a book, The Wisdom of the Ancient Chinese Tonic Herbs. I would credit him for bringing, uh, you know, Chinese tonic herbalism to the West uh, in kind of a very... Yeah, accessible way. Uh, not only that wisdom, but then also the herbs and everything as well. Yeah, and he's he's based. He's got a shop in Santa Monica and Beverly Hills. And uh, I mean, it's a scene, you know. I, I remember walking in there a number of years ago, and I recognized somebody in there. Uh, most people wouldn't have no idea who he is, but I was like, oh my gosh, is that Virgil Donati? Like, who's like in a drum circle? Like, he's like an incredible, amazing drummer. And there he was, just sitting at the bar, like nobody knew who he was. And <laughs> I'd seen him perform before, and I was like, oh my gosh, you're amazing. You're into herbs uh -huh. too. And yeah. But uh, one little last tangent uh, on the musical connection. I didn't get to share this last time, but you know, for those of you that are, are herbalists, uh, I did a course for Wild Rose College called uh, Business for Herbalists. And I brought in the musical analogy um, because, you know, it, it can be intimidating. You're a herbal student, you know, you're, you're building your knowledge and it's kind of like being in the music industry in that, you know, you got to put yourself out there, right? Yes. You're developing. I was, I was really, uh, quite thrilled when I saw that course come up. Oh, nice. Because it was long overdue. Yeah, for sure. You know, I met, it, it annoyed me over the years that some of my best students never became in anything. Right. Because they didn't have the self-confidence or whatever. Yeah. They didn't know where to start in the real world. And and then, in contrast, some of my worst students were the first ones to hang a shingle. Right. And doing a bunch of really crappy work and yeah. giving all of us a bad reputation. You know, but that's, yeah. that's the way the world works sometimes, you know. So there's... You know, there's a lot to that, like having that self-confidence, putting yourself out there. You know, I learned a lot from being in the music industry all the way from like busking, uh, kind of as a, as a teenager of like, okay, you got to show up, you know, the street's silent, you know, it's like, it takes a lot of like boldness to just start playing your drums and, you know, playing the music. Yes. And uh, so it did, like, that's a lesson in entrepreneurship and we can take an analogy from music and whatever styles you're into you know it's about putting yourself out there like developing a brand and uh, i can see how some people would feel intimidated which is like ah you know like what do i know that's different or original but isn't that music you know like everybody's copying everybody else using the same chords and this and that but you know there's never there was never a bob dylan before right even though what he was doing was yeah sure it was different and revolutionary was really not that actually different and he was getting inspiration from all his peers around him like yeah uh being your authentic self you know in, in that way uh, we can learn a lot from and sometimes you're a cover band too right. right i know a lot of people that would say like why didn't anybody listen to bob dylan he doesn't have a voice right but he was he he didn't it's sort of like me i never wanted to be a herbalist it just sort of right. happened yeah because he he was a poet yeah, that's Not right. a musician. No. But uh, he inspired so many hit songs mm -hmm. that other people sang his yeah. words, right? Yeah. And there was like, there was a real authenticity to him, you know? And, and I think that's what people crave and what they want. So as an herbalist, to put yourself out there with your, your personal touch, your brand, people will be drawn to it. And that's what's going to distinguish you between, you know, another herbalist, whether that's, you know, in a consultation type of context or you're developing products, like, uh, there's a lot of similarities there. So I've had a few occasions when there was either, it could be just somebody had a headache or I, I think on one occasion it was an injured animal and a bunch of huddle of people were trying to figure out what to do. And somebody said, Blaine, do some Reiki on it. And I said, well, I, I don't do, I've never studied Reiki. Right. And somebody else yelled out, you don't, you do it anyway, man. <laughs> you know? And, mm -hmm. and I didn't realize that I'd learned enough about energy work 
yeah. from other people that I actually could. Right. You know, I think we, we talked about that already. I yeah. think it came up. I love the um, the definition of uh, herbalism. And I this I don't know if it originated with Dave Wolf, but he was the guy that I heard this from. So he says, herbalism is nothing more than the institutionalization of wild food intuition. What do you think of that? Perfect. Yeah. yeah. You know, it kind of speaks to the Reiki. It's like, yes, there's this kind of formalized structure of Reiki and you haven't had a master and been passed down this and that. And, and there's value to that. I'm not knocking it. But it speaks more importantly to we all have access to it. It's energy. It's plant yes. medicine. It's observation. It's, yeah, and, and it's universal. It's all around the world. It's, we all have that potential uh, to tap into that. I used to, I have a walking staff that... There was a woman from Montana who had made one for my old friend Tarun Puri, who's, a, I think he's officially trained in Ayurvedic medicine. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had one, and my wife saw how much I was ogling it. Yeah. And so she sneaked in. This woman was at one of our health expos, um, and uh, she came by my booth just to talk to me. Right. To kind of pick up on my vibe. Yeah. And then... Um, um, somebody got my birth time and all of that. She needed that. Right. So it was it was an ancient. I didn't know at the time that juniper. Um, I always think of it as a little shrub, mm -hmm. but juniper gets massive. Right. Right. And so this is a, it's a walking stick. I mean, it's quite big, and she had carved into it all of my totem animals and angels and wow. various things, and that was a Christmas gift with some. So and there's a big. A chunk of quartz yeah, at the top say, of it. I remember crystals on that and, too. Uh, yeah, and I, so I used to always say on my herb walks, like, I don't actually remember any of this stuff because it's really just coming from there and it comes down through this piece of crystal and then into my hand and through to my lips. Right. So as long as I have my stick, I have my shtick. <laughs> that, that just kind of became a standing joke about that totally. staff, right? Yeah. So, um, but really it's probably true yeah you know yeah it's totally because yeah. there's little things we forget as we've discussed every time we do an episode like this both of us are you know later in the day or the next morning or whatever going, why why didn't i remember that part or that yeah, part like there's just there's so much to know right mm -hmm. so we, on that note you were going to bring up something about uh, chicken soup yeah um well i couldn't remember the tissue salt because it was like I was trying to say that chicken soup for cold is a really valid thing to do. Yeah. Most people know that. They've tried it and it works. Mm -hmm. Grandma taught them and it works. So why, why would you doubt that? If it works, it works. Um, so uh, potassium chloride uh, is a tissue salt that we use. And there's a, a little protein called fibrinogen that has a few uses in the body. Like if, um, if you cut yourself, um, blood vessels somehow touching tissue that they shouldn't be, like when an artery is cut open, release a single signal to an enzyme called thrombin right. that tells the fibrinogen to start holding hands and it forms long strands called fibrin yeah. that then start sticking together to form a blood clot. Right. And then retired red blood cells are called platelets, and they become like the mud, like a beaver lodge, right. that's make it, and that's how a clot forms. Hmm. But um, uh, back to fibrinogen, it's also, uh, in a similar fashion, the controller of mucus forming. And uh, because mucus is basically a, a protein-based substance that's very mucilogenic, and we use it as lubrication in many places of the body. Like yeah. some pe people constantly condemning mucus forming foods, but you don't, sw you don't want to ever spend a day of your life mucus free. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, you couldn't swallow food. You definitely wouldn't have sex. Um, uh, you'd be at high risk of infection actually from the air. Yeah. And so mucus is actually something that protects us a lot as well as a lubricant. So anyway, um, uh, Potassium chloride, or to um, if we take that to not a naturopath, a um, 
I just had a brain fart. Um, or people that work with tissue salts and oh, things. Oh, like a homeopath? A homeopath, thank yeah. you. Um, how, how blind. Um, it would be called Cali Mer right. with a K. Okay. Cali Mer is what they'd call it. Right. And um, uh, it's in chicken soup, and it's in... Um, maybe this is because the berries we talked about, the red elders, the berries being toxic, but the leaves aren't. Right. Um, so we know that calumer is also in the leaves, or sorry, in the flowers and bark of elder. Right. And it's in echinacea. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's in the our, our native tall red berried um, cranberry. Um, uh. Yeah, the, the high bush. Yeah, the high bush cranberry. The laburnum. And yeah, and um, I had, it's so interesting, and it's it, it's fun to share. You you do so many things with wildcrafting and whatnot. I, I have I have gone out over the years and had my bow and my fishing rod and spent a long weekend with no food at all, and yeah. you know just did it off the land once I knew what I was doing. Amazing. Um, but uh, it came up in class. I was just about to prune my, some things in my front yard which had become mostly a native herb garden. And there was red, um, some people didn't like the smell of it in the fall when it's in fruit. Right. There's this smell that comes off. Yeah. Uh, when I was quite young, I had decided that I could smell grouse. Hmm. I really believed for quite a, quite a few years that I could smell grouse, like if I was out hunting. There's some really nearby, I can smell them. Yeah. But what I was smelling was the red cranberries yeah. because they were there to eat the cranberry fruits, right? right. Yeah. So I eventually learned that I couldn't smell grouse. <laughs> I could smell this stinky fruit. But anyway. But by I, association, though, if they one were of, around. Yeah, one of my students was having a big problem with menstrual cramps, and we were covering the, the herb in class. Yeah. And somehow it came up that uh, I had some I was going to be pruning in the next 48 hours anyway. So she came by uh, the next morning on her bicycle and and cut a whole bunch of, she helped me prune a bunch of branches off right. and it was in the fall it's a good time when juices are flowing again to strip the bark off you don't want to I, I, I just don't leave these lay around for a couple of days because then they're going to dry and you won't be able to peel the bark off do it today or first thing tomorrow morning because right. then you can just peel the bark off yeah which is what we want and so she left is it outer bark inner bark I, I think we use the whole thing with that one right yeah yeah um and a lot of those bark issues, when they say inner bark, inner bark might be where the action is, but there's nothing wrong with the outer bark, so we just use the whole bark right. sort of thing. Yeah. Um, there's probably on that plant very little difference between them versus like, I want to chat about pine bark in a sec. I mean, that's a very distinct difference between the outer, which is that rough, hard. Yeah. Yeah. We get to the cambium layer, I think, isn't it? Yeah, or the xylem. Um, uh, side note again, uh, experimenting with trying some of the inner barks, which I had read uh, could be dried and ground into porridge yeah. and that sort of thing. And a lot of the trees that I tried, I remember using poplar once and even taking a fork out of the, and, and touching the, <laughs> the tines of the fork to my tongue. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> it was so horrible. You know, yeah, but they're but also some, described as starvation foods, right? Yes. So, <laughs> so back to that, there's there's edible wild plants that are gourmet, yeah, and there's edible plants that, if you really needed the calories, you could get by eating this kind of thing. Yeah, some of them aren't that hot. It's, it's like, do I eat this or the leather of my moccasins? You know? Yes. <laughs> um, that's become a standing joke at the home because they, it's quite typical in a lot of institutions to overcook meat like beef a lot right and when we have i think it's on the menu for tomorrow uh, roast beef and um, they'll put a slab on my plate and because i used to make moccasins uh, the other people at my table will kind of laugh and and i'll look at it and i think that's that's a sole for about a lady size seven there because it's so it's so tough you know they just overcooked the crap out of it yeah um anyway back to the gal in your glass with the so Away she, away she went with a couple of bungee cords yeah. and proper use of the word faggot, a bundle of sticks, <laughs> okay. Okay, um, on her little uh, little carrier on her bike. She I had a, that was a, the origin. A, yeah, that's a bundle of sticks is a right. faggot. If you're gathering tinder right. for, your, for your fire, that's... Because a cigarette used to be called a fag. 
that would be a stick, a single faggot, I, I suppose. I didn't know that either. Yeah. See, we just keep learning from each other. <laughs> the feedback we get around here. Yeah. So um, she was thrilled to get the bark anyway, and I would have just thrown it in the compost heap, you know. Yeah, totally. Um, so uh, I think black walnut was on that list too. Okay. Echinacea. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I hate it. I was just opening that book. Um, I kind of hate it, not hate, that's too strong of a word, but it disappoints me how often people just word the, euc the eucalyptus right. in a recipe. Yeah. Because the different species of eucalyptus are so completely different yeah. with their chemistry. Right. And to just say eucalyptus. Yeah. And a lot of people think that eucalyptus has those little round leaves. You know, like because we see those in flower arrangements and stuff, and so that's eucalyptus, right? right? Yeah. And it's very fragrant. But there's about 700 species of eucalyptus. Jeez. And silver dollar, it's called eucalyptus with the round leaves, yeah, okay. is, yeah. isn't used medicinally for anything. Right. Um, most, most eucalyptus leaves look more like our willow leaves. Yeah, long. They're, yeah, they're yeah. Lance, lanceolate. Lance, like, yeah. And, um, that's the one I know of. Anyways. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, but there's a big difference between the two most common ones when we work with oils uh, are globulus yeah. and radiata, and they're substantially different. Right. So to just write a recipe that says eucalyptus, or if a bottle just says eucalyptus and you don't know what species it is, um, I could tell which, which kind it was my, from training from my nose, right. smelling them. One of them has a lot of ketones in it, the other one doesn't. So that, that makes a big difference what you're doing with them when you're pregnant, for example. And, right. and it just it disappoints me that, you, or like even with the different kinds of um, echinacea. Yeah. You know, angustifolia and purpurea. purpurea work quite differently. Yeah. You know? we, we did spent a whole episode, or at least half of it, talking about uh, chamomile, you know, the two different types there as well. well and well, it's more than two, really. But, but, but the main ones are the, German and Roman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah. And then there's, cranberry, uh, I've often got them confused because there's the viburnum, which is often referred to as the high bush. And then, at least in my mind, I was always like, okay, you know, cramp bark, viburnum, that's the high bush cranberry. And then the vaccinium, I would call the low bush, which is uh, lingon berries, delicious, wonderful berries yep. that don't have that smell. However, there's two different types of viburnum that are called low bush and high bush. And apparent, that, that's what I learned recently, actually. Right. And, and then the vaccinium is actually... Their first cousins to blueberries, too. Yeah, right. yeah. Whereas the vaccinium is like, okay, that makes sense. It's not really a bush. It's like a low kind of, it's like uversi, like kind of trailing yeah. plant in that sense. And they do this thing where the berries will, the plant itself is evergreen. Yeah, that's you know, right. it, it stays there, and so the fruit will stay on the plant. And as we get into spring, when things start melting and thawing, and then sun, sunny days, and then freezing again, yeah, um, the low bush cranberries can actually end up with quite a bit of alcohol in them. Yeah, and yeah. so occasionally you'll run into animals that are half drunk totally. from eating the berries. Like if you see a grouse kind of flying like right. like that, um, I think it had too many <laughs> berries. Yeah. Uh, Terry has a great story about running into a bear one day that had found a little, there was a little path going up a hillside and it was just a kind of a muddy little path, or was it snow, I can't remember, it doesn't matter. But this bear had eaten too many of those berries. Yeah. And first he saw a bear, oh, and he was scared, but then he stopped and he just watched this bear. It was going, like running a toboggan, it was going back up the hill again and running down on its bum, sliding down the hill, <laughs> kind of going yippee. Yeah, yeah. So there was a bear that got a little high on yeah. some wild cranberries that were fermenting. And of course, Crazy. in the spring, you can often see like, you know, the, the wax wings and uh, who are the other ones? Uh, the spring birds are coming in flocks. And yeah, it's not a Stellar's Jay. Anyways, the starling. No, no, that's not what you're thinking about. No. Anyway, they're um, black with the kind of like speckled. Wax wings and there's two, yeah, there's there's two birds one. that are. Mm. Anyways, okay. you know, again, like erratic flight patterns after they come. They'll come and just like clean an entire bush. Yeah, yeah, they come into berries. my neighborhood and yeah. they'll, they'll hit my big mountain ashes like a blender. Yeah. And there's just this. <laughs> and they, 
and then they'll just go like a swarm of locusts yeah. a block down and hit another tree. And what's really cool, so you've watched um, that Stephen Buhner uh, lecture, The Living Touch of the Wild Earth. I'm pretty sure it was in that uh, session that he brought up a, an Indian researcher who was studying the effects of, of alcohol, but actually on plants. And so his kind of preposition was that the, the trees, like let's take an apple tree, is actually producing fruit to create alcohol for itself. Because uh, you know, if those apples drop and then it kind of gets into the ground, into the roots, he had some way of like kind of measuring oh, the oh. plants. You know how they, it's like, oh, look at responding to music. Look at it responding to, you know, lovely, uh, you know, peaceful gestures or you know, ne negativity, all that kind of thing. They're able to kind of measure a plant's response. Um, he did this at like you know feeding them alcohol, and it went through like a very same like kind of curve like we humans do. This kind of like rise of elation, and then kind of a lower type of depression afterwards. Yeah, well, alcohol in small doses is a stimulant. Yeah, but yeah. it very quickly becomes a depressant. Yeah. So if you go to a wine and cheese or something like that, and you have a glass of wine, the most two, you're all chatty and having fun. Yeah. But if you have any more, you're under the table somewhere having a nap. Right? Yeah, but so. We're, we're so like species centric thinking like, well, we're the only ones that, uh, you know, enjoy alcohol or psychedelics or something like that. But uh, animals, absolutely, right? I, I had a friend who grew some magic mushrooms and he gave me his spent like the rye greens. I don't know why, how this happened, but whatever. I was like, oh, I'll just throw them out on the deck. I'll put them, you know, in this little area. And Sure enough, the squirrels came and like, I can only imagine it was affecting their uh, system just in the same way. And why not plants, you know, like, uh, why not the fungi? What, what is the reality of a, of a psilocybin mushroom, right? What's, yeah. what's their consciousness going on? And the way squirrels rip around anyway. <laughs> That would be even sillier to see. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're big into mushrooms, right? The, the origin of uh, kind of like hanging things in the trees, the squirrels will do that. They'll prepare, or so they'll, they'll pick the mushrooms, and then they go whoosh, put them in the trees, uh, hanging upside down to yep. dry. Right, on branches, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which we now know also, because of that sunlight, uh, synthesizes vitamin D, which being a mammal, I'm sure. On a few occasions, um, over the years, I had found a hollow stump or something, hollow tree, that was full, like a couple of, just full, two cups worth of dried nuts. Yeah. Like in places like the, the pines around here don't get the big cones. Right. But when you're down around that um, Waterton area, Crow's Nest Pass, yeah. there's one called Whitebark Pine and another one called Silver Pine. Oh, okay. And they get the big cones oh, that amazing. have pine nuts like the ones that we buy in the store. They're that big. Cool. Um, and so um, uh, when I found the trees like that, um, I realized, or I th had a theory, that the reason squirrels are constantly running around so crazy about gathering nuts and gathering nuts and gathering nuts and gathering nuts and gathering nuts was that they can't remember where the ones they gathered last week are. Right. <laughs> you know, they just lose half of them. Yeah. So I didn't feel guilty stealing the nuts from the squirrels. Yeah. And um, a little saliva doesn't bother me because we're going to roast them anyway. Yeah. And so uh, I went definitely went down there a couple of times and ripped off squirrels yeah. for their nuts in the trees. Yeah. Well, like you say, they probably would have forgot anyways. But, uh, well, and sometimes you'll find them and they're moldy. Right. They definitely forgot them there. Yeah. yeah. I actually, so last time I was out on Vancouver Island, uh, driving along, and I'm always looking for, you know, wild foods, number one, you know, and I just like, well, I love the plant life out there. I love it anywhere. And uh, the sign caught my eye, fresh figs for sale, which I scored, like, huge tray of figs, like, you know, for, for nothing. It was this old couple. But then the other thing they had were pine nut trees and uh, little, little kind of seedlings. So I bought, a, I bought a pine nut tree. So I've got it as a house plant. I mean, it's, it's incredibly small still, and it might take, you know, 20 years, and who knows if I'll ever get one from it. But uh, yeah, I just like, I like doing that kind of thing. It's Why like, not? Yeah, totally. So I'm not sure if it'll grow and thrive in this environment. Like, you know, will I ever put it outside? I don't know, we'll see. But uh, I think what it actually might be, instead of a, of a true pine, it could actually be uh, a ringing cedar. Um, I'll show it to you. It's just right over here. I'm going to grab it because it's, it's cool to check out. 
I know you're a big uh, proponent of... It'll, it'll want a really sunny spot, I think. Probably. I think pines do. Yeah. If it doesn't do well, he's going to pine about his pine. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's totally a seedling. Isn't that cool? Yeah, look at that. Like, so that's obviously what first, you know, sprouted. It's, I, I'm, that's why I'm thinking, like, maybe ringing cedar, you know, this kind of like a ring around it. Yes. Um, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's gorgeous, isn't it? That's it's just so, so cool. cute. Yeah, it's like, yeah, I'm going to get one of those. So, cool. There we are. So. So. Did you buy it just what we see now? Exactly. Or has it grown? No, it hasn't really grown. Not yet. It's just been, a, it's been like two or three months I've had it. Maybe three months. Well, put it in a bigger pot sooner than later. Okay. Because I'm quite confident in saying that um, plants, the root system, will kind of go out from this... I kind of, oh, we live in a really little place, so we better stay tiny. Right, okay, yeah. And if you give it a bigger space, right. uh, it'll get more roots, and then that'll give it the courage to get taller. Yeah, cool. Okay. Hey, let us know in the comments. Do you have any sort of fun, unique plants that you've sourced from other places? You must have a story about... Uh, I mean, because your yard was phenomenal. Uh, all the things that you had gathered, I imagine some of those came from the wild and... Uh... Oh, the yard was mostly wild. Wild, yeah. That's why plant people used to... Uh, at times I'd see somebody scratching their nose or rubbing or scratching their bum or whatever, pointing at things with somebody else trying to figure out some of the plants there. Right. Because they weren't house plants. They weren't things you buy at the plant store. They were wild. Yeah, yeah. And I brought a few things from other places uh, like I brought things back from the boreal forest for sure. Right. Uh, I eventually ended up, and that's if I want to choose to get sad about it, then I could. But I had um, uh, a, a wild white birch tree and um, um, a couple of choke cherries and saskatoons and various things that were all boreal forest plants, right? So, yeah. so my yard was kind of a shrine between the Ghost River area and the Boreal Forest. Yeah. Cool. And um, um, it makes sense to do that from the perspective that these are plants that survive here. You know, you can't get a bird of paradise plant and put it in your yard and let it live. It's not going, it's from Hawaii, you know? <laughs> so it's gonna die and that's that. Yeah. Um, but that's the fun of having the indoor plants and, yeah. you know, you, did you have like a fountain? No, that was outside. But, you know, you used to bring it in. in, the, in no, the winter, I, had, I had it three ponds, actually. Three ponds. The, wow. the big one outside was as wide as the garage. Right. And part of it, when I originally laid the, uh, if anybody's ever going to build a pond, you can buy <laughs> preformed things that you kind of dig a hole in the ground and put in. Yeah. And they're going to live for several years. Um, um, and then you can just buy rolled black plastic material and you can freeform that way and do whatever you want mm -hmm. and if you're gonna uh, you want to when you dig the hole kind of don't just dig a round hole because then you can't really could put rocks in there they're just gonna slide down kind of dig dig the the bottom or the sides of the pond as you go with kind of little steps that slant towards the back wall and then you go up some more and then do another one of those hmm. so that when, when the liner's in there, you can put a rock there without it sliding down. Ah. And then another rock can go on top of that rock. So you can rock line right. the whole pond. So ah, there, there's okay. a tip. Yeah, but yeah. something, I, I've always been with building things, um, a lot of people think that they, they're, they're happy because they scrimp, scrimped a bit on building code. And I'm one of those guys that's going to go, okay, so it's going to cost me this much money to build the deck, uh, and they want 12-inch center, 16-inch centers. Well, I'm going to put 12-inch centers because it's going to be that much stronger. You say, well, you didn't need to do that. So how many extra boards did I have to buy? Two? Right. You know, and so for an extra $100, I got a deck that it doesn't... I remember one party, the upstairs deck was completely full of people, and somebody looked at me and said, are we okay here? <laughs> <laughs> you know? And I know that I had a backhoe in and go eight feet down and put in concrete platforms this big and then put concrete posts right. and then, you know, it, like 
yes, yeah. this this deck is good for tons. Right. right. So I, I like to go overboard. But anyway, uh, for a little money more, they'll have this gray uh, rubber material that's quite thick, kind of like like a big inner tube from a tractor tire might be. Like it's it's thick rubber. Yeah. And uh, that's what I used. And as it turns out, the um, the woman that was renting next door had a boyfriend from Ontario, and he saw the pond once it was done. And I forget what it was called, but he said, I, I hope you, you used that whatever blah, blah, woof membrane. And I said, well, I did, as a matter of fact, why? And he said, well, that black plastic stuff, um, in the winter, there's, there's little rocks and things and, and dirt in the ground. And when ice freezes, uh, it'll the little rocks are poke holes in it. Like oh. you, you'll be lucky to get two years right. out of a pond. Yeah. And it's all that work to build the pond and plant it and rock it and all that, right? Yeah, yeah. So I was quite thrilled that I used that <laughs> liner. And he said, that's, that's good for a hundred years. It's going to be right. just fine, you know? So buy that gray rubber stuff yeah. as opposed to the thin black plastic. But, um, and then the other thing was, I, I didn't think about it building the pond, but it was about four feet deep in the middle. And, um, um, two waterfalls, one into a little pond here and then into another one. Um, and we went on vacation and came back and there was a foot and a half of algae in there. And I talked to somebody and said, oh yeah, well, unless you want to put chemicals in it, uh, you, you got to get fish. Right. And I, I didn't realize that going in, but um, uh, the guy at the pet store said, well, do you know anything about fish? And I said, well, uh, at one point when I was quite young, I had 17 aquariums and my brother and I used to sell we, we raised fish like angel fish and stuff and sold them to the pet shop. Wow. Um, we never really made any money because we would just buy more aquariums and, and it just, <laughs> we were sort of bartering our way into more stuff. But um, I haven't had any for years. And he said, well, do this for the first year. You can buy these little goldfish. We just call them feeders because people use them to feed big fish and snakes and things. Right. So you can get 10 feeders, this goldfish about this long, mm -hmm. for, for a dollar each. You get, we just get $9.99, you got 10 fish. Yeah. And just, just try some feeders and see how you do. So um, um, I put 20 feeders in there, and I think through the course of the summer, they cleaned up all the algae right away. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe one died. Right. So we thought that's fine, but now what are we going to do? My, my first wife could not accept that these weren't kittens. They were fish because <laughs> I was trying to convince her that they will live through the winter in this pond. It's going to, we have to keep a hole open so air can come in, right. but um, I wasn't going to heat it. That was going to be expensive. You can buy uh, trough heaters right. for, for um, uh, water, um, I was going to say buckets or troughs yeah. at, at the farm. You know, you get these little pond, um, trough heaters. And, and I did a little math on the, um, how many watts that would draw and the power it would use over the winter. And I thought, well, I don't really want to use that. So I ended up buying a little indoor pond. Right. And uh, I had also bought the first year some papyrus. Ah. And, and they were just these cute little papyrus yeah. bushes about this big. Those are cool and, plants. And, and since, since my experience with them, Whenever I see anybody at the store in the spring with buying their bedding plants, I'll see somebody with, similarly, they're buying a couple of little pond plants. I said, oh, have you got a new pond? And yes, we're putting in a pond. I put that one at the back. <laughs> and and what, do they get tall? Like, over nine feet. <laughs> you know? So yeah. uh, the first year that I brought them in, they went all the way up to the ceiling and bent over and came halfway down again. So they, they wanted to be nine feet tall. Yeah. And um, they were really good for accounting for back to plant intelligence. Um, so anywhere on a plant stem that something happens, like a leaf or another stem comes off, it's called a node, right? Right. And so in the internodal space, nothing happens. Right. So um, if an orchid has finally spent, don't cut anything down that isn't dry stick dead. Right. When I first started getting orchids, I would cut them off and uh, some little Hungarian woman also shopping for orchids one morning at wherever we were, Home Depot or something like that. They had a sale on. And she said, no, no, never cut like that. You'd see here, see here, more come. And so she taught me about leaving the nodes there right. with orchids because they can branch out and flower. I've had orchids that have flowered for 20 years. Wow. They keep coming back, you know, because yeah. you just handle them right. But um, uh, where was I going with all that? So what was amazing... 
about papyrus was this is where papyri came from. Right. The long fibers in the stalks are what they made the scrolls with in the old days. Yeah. So that was our first paper. Because there's long spaces between the nodes. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, the, the big things out of the root system come way up like this. Yeah. So, so she looked at me and said, you know how to make babies? And I said, well, I've been trying to avoid that, actually. <laughs> she said, no, 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 from plants, to make babies from plants. So she showed me how to, you take these big, they, they look like they're pinnately divided, uh, so that they're like palm leaves about this big, and you, you hold, hold them together, like if some phone broke in the wind, let's say, mm -hmm. it's gonna die anyway. Um, hold the, all those big leaves together and snip them off about an inch long, yeah. and then snip the, the stem off about an inch and a half long at an angle and just throw that in some water right. and roots will sprout. Hmm. And, and then out of the dead leaflets, roots will come or sometimes another whole plant will come. Wow. And sometimes they will flower. Ooh. So from the same place, you could get a new plant, roots, or flower, excuse me. Wow. And um, so those were fun, and I probably gave away at least 100 of yeah. those that other people got, right. got to do the same. And if you put them, they'd get so, biz so big, I would end up having them, because you couldn't leave them out for the winter, they would freeze. Uh, I would have them in five gallon pails. Right. They were, they were that big and it would form, you'd bring them in and it would fill the whole corner of your, wow. of your home there because uh, they wanted to dangle just a little bit. Yeah. Quite pretty in the house. They are. Um, and um, uh, I'd give away whole plants like that in five gallon pails because hmm. I just kept growing them and giving them away and growing them and giving them away because I kept having babies with them. You know? <laughs> Cool. Anyway, we're way off topic. We're supposed to be here talking about medicinal plants. But anyway, yeah. we're, at least we're talking about plants. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So something wacky that I had asked you in the car yeah. and you denied me was if, if the numbers 23 degrees, 17 minutes mean anything to you. 23 degrees, 17 minutes. So that's an angle, a measurement of an angle. Oh, so it's not uh, you know, like a tanning formula. You want to be on one side, 23 degree weather, or seven, no. No, 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 this is, this is like a protractor <laughs> thing. 23 degrees, 17 minutes. So, so a degree is cut into minutes, right? yeah. it's smaller than a minute. 23 degrees, 17 minutes. So if you have a globe at home, the earth on a globe, it's usually on a little wire stand mm -hmm. and it sits at an angle there on your coffee table and you can spin it around because you look like you're going to go to trip to Africa or something like that. Hey, let's look at the world. And um, I think I grew up with one of those in the living room. Twenty. So it's, but they're never straight up and down. They're always on a tilt. Yeah. And I didn't know that that represented the Earth's axis. That our Earth is spinning in space, and I think the axis is I don't know pointing to the center of the universe or something like that. Well, as it turns out, um, most anatomy books that you look at uh, of the chest, the heart is sitting at a little angle as well. Mm -hmm. And if you cut somebody open, so we'd maybe use a cadaver for this, not one of your friends. Yeah. Um, if you fired, even with a living heart, if you used a wooden arrow, not a metal arrow, if you fired, um, or carefully with a dead heart, if you, if you pushed a wooden arrow down through, it's called the mediastinum, it's the left side of the heart and the right side of the heart. So, yeah. so if, you push, if you push a piece of wood through that, it's 23 degrees and 17 minutes. Wow. What could that possibly mean? But I, 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 refer, I just refuse to accept that it's just, in, just incidental, just yeah. coincidental. Um, so does that mean if you go out in the backyard and kind of like turn around a couple of times, at some point there your heart is pointing home? Home is where the heart is, right? You know, like, yeah. is, isn't that fascinating though? No, 23 degrees, 17 minutes. So. Yeah, it's that micro macro reflection. Yeah. Yeah, very we cool. We can, we can get into all sorts, that could be a whole segment. But um, anyway. Yeah, no, I'd never um, heard that before. So back to something cool. that just happened here within the last couple of days. I don't usually watch the news much because it's too depressing. I, uh, they turned it on in, in the dining room and the first thing on was um, forest fires in rainforests, uh, in, still in BC, 
uh, rainforests in California, right. rainforests in Hawaii. Jeez. These are rainforests, and there's forests burning that are rainforests, right? Yeah. Like with climate Jeez. change, all this stuff. Yeah. And then they switched. The next segment was someplace in India where the pollution was so bad was... Uh, people were, but it was some natural phenomena. It wasn't just dust. I, don't know, I can't remember what it was, but it was the, you. You couldn't see a, the house across the street. The, right. It was that kind of thick, like fog. Well, I mean, that's an average day in Delhi, to be honest. Just well, the, it, from pictures I've seen, yeah. Yeah. You know, but it was, uh, it was just that bad. And you think about wow, just how horrific some of here we live in Calgary with generally clear skies and. Oh man, fresh we, air from the mountains and, you and know. beautiful water, you know, so close to the source. Um, it prides me just, I delight in where I go fishing with my brother in northern Saskatchewan, that we're usually in places where at no point during the day would I hesitate to dip a cup and drink yeah. right out of the lake. Yeah. And not many people in the world have that luxury anymore. No, it's so true. You yeah. know, Canada's water, we have so much water and it's... Yeah. We, we may one day have to defend it. Yeah. You know, our southern friends might be attacking us, never mind oil uh, pipelines. They might be stealing our water. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we'll sell it. I don't know. But, you know, we're one of the biggest fresh water sources on the planet. Yeah, it's true. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And very few people have had an experience of wild water. I mean, here we are. We talk about wild foods all the time. And... Uh, Wild water is, is something else. Uh, I like to give the analogy. It's just like, you know, apple off the tree, carrot out of the ground. Like nothing beats that, that level of freshness. Like oh, yeah. a strawberry, a wild strawberry, fresh off the plant. And water has a similar experience. There's a qualitative difference. And, uh, you know, I, I was a real water snob for a number of years. Like just having that experience, high standards, like, oh, I only drink spring water. And uh, I, I still like to adhere to that. But humbled a little bit when you go travel to somewhere like LA or London, England or Florida and you know, the tap water is like, oh my gosh, like we have amazing, beautiful, incredible water here that we have access to even out of the taps. I'm still going to yeah, filter yeah. I it. Think, I think Calgary tap out. water is, um, we were one of the 20 top cities in the world. Yeah, I can for imagine. For tap water, something like that. I just remember a survey. Yeah, yeah. I, that does not surprise me, for sure. So. And there's, there's times when in the spring, some years with runoff into the Alvo, like the city isn't just all one water source. Right. Uh, your house is, is coming from the Bow River. Yeah. But in southern Calgary, they're drinking water from the Alvo River. Right. And sometimes the runoff in the spring... Uh, like you've been hiking in the spring maybe and you'll see that the water from all the dead leaves from last fall, the water is literally a brown color. Mm. It almost looks like tea. Yeah. So at times they might say, well, this is, this is too much for the water treatment plant to handle. Right. So we get these um, wa boil water warnings once in a while oh, in I've the never spring. Oh, I've never seen that. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. And it's usually just for South Calgary. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've always lived in the north, so maybe that's... The There's a thing in the Bow River that it took me a while to figure out what it was. Uh, it's a big concrete thing that whether I was rafting or canoeing, I would kind of grab onto and just hold its... It's right by Bow Nest Park, isn't it? That thing? Um, yeah, but, yeah, but, uh, uh, I guess... Well, wait a minute. I used to paddle from Bow Nest Park back to downtown. Right. So it's... Well, where it is, is precisely... Uh, due south of the hospital oh. because what it is is that if the water system ever completely screwed up they've got a pipe in the ground that's what that concrete thing is oh, is it's a it's a thing to hold the end of the pipe in the river huh. so that they can actually pump water directly from the river uphill to the hospital oh, and it could be treated there wow. or at least be used for um, uh, plumbing yeah. or toilets to flush and that sort of thing and by the hospital you mean the foothills yes so I'm right sorry. down by edworthy um, uh, yeah, well, it's yeah, a little ways, but yeah, 29th Street. Oh, okay. Right, this oh, is the hospital. Very, very curious. Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, I don't know how I, somebody told me or whatever that was, but it's, yeah, it's a, hosp it's a water inlet. Okay. For the hospital. Have you ever, maybe the thing I'm thinking of, I think Edworthy is where the outlet comes from the spring from Nose Hill. Have you ever heard about that? Like Nose Hill apparently has this massive spring 
it's just like gushing water that they like piped and channeled all the way. Yeah, and it's one of the only places on that whole stretch of water that because of it coming in with creating enough current, um, the water there's about nine feet deep. Right. Because I've ran the river a few times with my canoe and I have a graph for, for fishing. Yeah. There's only a couple of places all the way from uh, Bonas Park to the zoo where other than during runoff that the Bow River is any deeper than about three and a half feet. Right. So in most of the city, most months of the year, you can just walk across the river. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people don't realize that. Like if you cross the Center Street Bridge, most right. months of the year, you can look down and see the rocks and stuff right there in the water if yeah. it's clear, right? Yeah. That's as deep as it is in most parts of the city. Yeah, I know it's true. Yeah, yeah. So um, anyway, this current events thing I brought up, I, I was... I, I usually don't watch the news, but um, there was that event, and then it switched over to, um, in eastern Canada, there's a, a significant outbreak of salmonella right now, mm -hmm. and a few children have died, and um, um, any of the existing antibiotics aren't touching this particular strain of salmonella. Right. So it's one of those kind of like COPD where we've got something that's it's, uh, it's resisting to any of the current drugs. And just before closing the segment, uh, the newscaster said something about so that the drug companies are going to be under pressure to go find new antibiotics. Like all of the big drug companies have scouts yeah. um, uh, in jungles and whatnot looking for new plants that they can turn into a something, you know. They, yeah. they all do, all the big pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. And... Um, um, what was that movie called with, was it Sean Connery? And they, he was trying to figure out, he was one of those people in the movie, and he was trying to figure out, he discovered something that was anti-tumoral. Oh. But it had something to do in the end with, it wasn't in the plant, it had something to do with ants in the flowers or something like that. Oh, okay. I, I can't remember, it's a long time. Anyway, um, so... I kind of stopped and stared at the TV for a while because we have so many plants or their extracts, like in particular essential oils and um, fungi and whatnot that we know from not some kind of, I did it in my backyard experiment, but serious, when, when pharmaceuticals came along, one by one we threw our herbs away and just went to drugs, right? right. Like I, I was born um, well, some threw them away. Like, some of the people were thrown away. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I, I was when I was a little boy, pen penicillin was new, right? right. Penicillin was yeah. invented in about uh, uh, the 1920s or 30s, I think, somewhere in there. Yeah. So it was still a relatively new drug. And um, we would use it for anything. You had an infected cut on your finger that looked a little not so good. You'd take some penicillin. You had you know, an infected tooth in your mouth. You cut yourself. Uh, you sick. You, like, we used penicillin for just about everything. It became the cure-all. Right? Right. And um, I, I can remember somebody saying, oh, is little Blaine allergic to penicillin yet? Uh, oh, well, we'll give them some more. You know, they handed it out like candy right, for yeah. just about any sort of infection. So that's why we ended up with antibiotic-resistant drugs, yeah. is we just overuse them. Mm -hmm. And the, the plants are smart. I remember, well, uh, again, the, this is... And the bacteria are smart. <laughs> yeah, and there was... I don't know how they got this footage, but it wasn't a cartoon. Some documentary I was watching years ago where um, they were crop dusting. Um, they had something that they were using to kill potato beetles. Right. And they had, within a couple of generations, um, mutated enough that they ate the chemical. <laughs> and they had footage of... It became their like, superpower. Like the, beetles, the beetles were... Like, it's almost like they could hear the planes coming yeah. and they would curl up to the leaves <laughs> to kind of go like this and say, yeah, bring it on, buddies. <laughs> but they were... In, in short, it didn't take them that long to mutate, to, yeah. to eat the bad guys, right? Right. So anyway, um, I kind of was a little bit choked and thinking, well, there's several essential oils, even tea tree handles, uh, as far as I know, uh, all strains of Staphylococcus and Streptococcus. Uh, this might be a new strain, so maybe I'm wrong in saying this, but um, the big phenols that we have in uh, Thymus vulgaris, which is what we call red thyme, yeah. when you get the oil, um, uh, is, which is almost identical to oregano, 
So those two plants uh, have high concentration of phenols, like the essential oil is in the neighborhood of, oh, over 80% one chemical, one phenol. Yeah. Uh, and so red thyme has a lot of thymol and a little bit of uh, eugenol, and oregano has a lot of eugenol and a little bit of thymol, but they both work pretty much the same way. I was, for some reason, I don't know, just a gut feeling, but when I started working with oils, I, I work more with red thyme. Maybe I'm just, I have to be different. I don't mm -hmm. know, but everybody was using oregano, so I had to use red thyme. Yeah. I, I still, I have six kinds of oregano, or had. Um, most of that stuff's out, gone now because of this whole switch in my life. But um, uh, we've got lots of things that kill staph yeah. and strep. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it's, you know, this is, it's a duty, I would say. I'm just going to call it outright because, you know, we, we know about antibiotic resistance. It's this kind of like looming disaster on the horizon. And, uh, you know, we have a duty to kind of step out and break that cycle and go back to plants. But part of what happens, because when I thought about it afterwards, I thought that if, if we get too loudmouthed about how well, I'm just going to stick with oils because that was my specialty, how well the oils work, Right. because this has already happened a few times, uh, where the government runs some tests and go, oh, these do work, so you can't have them anymore. Right. And they take them away on us <laughs> because now they're drugs. Yeah. And, and you know, you need a DIN number and all of that stuff, right? Yeah. No, it's already um, happening. And that's that's happened. Yeah. And um, the NPNs that we need um, were free for a while. I think they're still pretty cheap, but DINs for a pharmaceutical company can cost as much as a quarter of a million dollars because you have to do all these double-blind studies and everything else. And yeah, and so, that's, that's what they want to push on uh, NHP's natural health products to get your NPNs, your natural right. product Well, numbers. it's already on us, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It started slow, but it's pretty much yeah. in, in force now. Which brings up a point, it's, it's just challenging, you know, talking with Yara Willard about this. It's like, okay, you know, and he used valerian as, as the example. It's like, great, everyone knows valerian, you know, that one passes. There's going to be, you know, you know, 70 different valerian products on the market. But there's so many other lesser known herbs that actually might be better for somebody in certain cases. And when we talk about antibiotic resistance, here's where it really becomes key. It's like, okay, great, oregano's out there, that's approved. But what about all the other ones, like Red Time, and you know the list goes on and on. And uh, I brought this book out. This is the first uh, printing of Stephen Harry Buner's Herbal Antibiotics, uh, and the whole premise of it is uh, natural alternatives for treating drug-resistant bacteria. He since you know expanded it probably about three or four times. It's quite a thick book now. He's got an accompanying antivirals. It's an amazing book. One of the challenges is you can't find the herbs. You know, he's listing all these great herbs and these properties and it's like, well, where do I get that one? You know, like, mm. don't get me wrong, there's a lot of common ones, like he lists garlic, he lists usnia, he lists, you know, things that we can access. But there's a lot that, you know, we just won't ever have access to because of the process of, you know, getting the, the NPN. And, right. and because it's, it's it, the government would, you know, consider it novel, right? Like, there haven't been the studies on it. There are, isn't that kind of huge volume of, of literature about, you know, valerian, again, as the example. Like, okay, we got that one approved, but there's all these other ones. And I think diversity is the key, you know? Like, if these bacteria, that are intelligent, they can develop resistance, you know, if we're only just suddenly switched like oregano, 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 it's, it's, it's a different game than using antibiotics. But correct me if I'm wrong, there could be a resistance to oregano, you know, if, if that's all we're using. Well, yeah. 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 And it's, that's already happened with tea tree. Right. There's some bacteria that we've, um, from overusing, uh, we've got tea tree resistant, just like penicillin resistant bacteria now. Yeah. Um, so um, we'll see where this goes. But in my heart of hearts, I just know that those children in Ontario or whatever that was did not need to die. There was several things we could have treated totally. those infections with. And not to mention, and I don't want to project that this was the scenario, uh, so I certainly don't want to minimize them and their deaths. I 100% agree that there could have been other alternatives. But if there were just like actual basics of like, you know, health, human health. And I talked about like the microbiome, you know, and we brought this up on the, on right, the right, way right. over, yep. right? Like a healthy microbiome, 
as a foundation, way less susceptible. Like that, you know, he does talk about that in the book. Like, you know, what's your first line of defense? Like building that healthy immune system with an intact microbiome. You know, the way that kids are and how we've been raised and, you know, like we're going in behind the eight ball. Like they're, they're disadvantaged already, more susceptible. Um, yeah, so we need to get that foundation first and then have more of an alternative uh, arsenal of, of plants that they're all out there. I mean, this, you know. I, I had picked up somewhere a few years ago, I think, and so am I right or wrong in thinking this, that uh, your my microbiome is as unique as your fingerprints. Yeah, yeah. And you go with that? Yeah, totally, yeah. And one, they've been studying like indigenous people, and, and by that, like people who are have lived traditionally in different parts of the world, so. Yes, people in the Amazon and Africa and that kind of thing, but all around the world. And anybody living in a more you know traditional lifestyle actually has a more diverse microbiome. I mean, it's like you, oh, you might go to Mexico, for example, and drink some river water, and the guy beside you, who's your guide, can drink six quarts of it and doesn't have any problems. But yeah. you've got diarrhea within four hours. Totally. Sort of thing, right? <laughs> yeah. So us, we've you know, my friend Danny Vitalis, he, you know, he's labeled us like uh, you know. Uh, Homo sapiens fragilis, you know, we, <laughs> we've, we've evolved to be, or devolved to become so sensitive, so fragile, we just don't have that resilience. And, and part of it they're showing in these kind of microbiome studies is, you know, there's not only is there like less number of, of healthy bacteria, but also like less diversity. Uh, and it, I mean, that's the inner, the outer, it's reflected in, in nature, right? The loss of species and diversity is like, it's happening on the macro level yep. in our forests, in our oceans, in our rivers but also internally too. Yeah, I had, I can't remember who I was talking to yesterday and I hadn't thought of this experience for years that somebody phoned me one day, he'd seen me speaking at a health expo, I think, and his wife was really sick and he called me because he thought, well, Lane obviously knows what to do here. And he had a list, as long as your arm, of what was wrong with his wife and some of it was, it may as well have been a gunshot wound on top of it. And, yeah. and he said, so, you know, what, what should I use her? Can I bring her to see you? And I said, how about take her to a hospital? <laughs> you know, like, because some of what he was listing was way right. over the scope of what I would treat as a herbalist. You yeah, know? yeah. Um, so back to what I've said about referrals. You know? Right. But I mean, like, I, I, I wanted to slap the guy. If, I, if, we, if he was actually there, right. I probably would have put him up against the wall and slapped him and been, take yeah. your wife to a doctor, you know, like, yeah. like, get her to an ER as soon as possible. Like, because right. he's, he was blindsided by, and I've, I've met people like that that want to do everything naturally with herbs, but there's a time mm -hmm. and place, and we keep coming back to that, where you actually need pharmaceuticals, yeah. you know, and we need surgery. I mean, I've had my knees replaced. Totally. I, I was doing everything else, right? They had a list about this long, of things that you they wanted you to do before you were ever considered for a knee replacement, uh, taking you know the right fatty acids in your diet and all of that was all considered, and I had to get um, orthotics for my shoes, Right. And I had to wear these silly braces for a while. And I, after going through all of that, uh, it became, and the, the expression quality of life right. is what finally got me in to the hip and knee clinic. I had to stress with my own doctor that, like, I just can't do a lot of what I'm used to doing. This has gotten to the point of absurdity. And so she had to write a letter to the hip and knee clinic for me to get a refer. It's a whole referral system right. that finally got me in. Yeah. And then when they actually met me and saw what I'd gone through, I was on a short list, right. which really annoyed some of the people I talked to because they'd been waiting for two years to get knees. Yeah. And I ended up getting in in a couple of months for some reason. Wow. Um, but, I mean, my knees were shot. Yeah. And I was trying... Um, uh, it, 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 well, I, I had a, a doctor appointment to get my card for CBD oils. Right. Which helped me to the point that there were nights when my knees were throbbing so much I couldn't sleep. Wow. So one of the CBD oils helped me with that. It wasn't going to fix my knees. No. But it got me past a certain level of pain threshold. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. Cool. Yeah, I mean, that's a whole other topic for another conversation that's it's in the news, you know? Yeah. Alberta's health system and how that's changing and how it's broken and how do we fix it and... But ultimately, you know, we've got to have that foundation. Starts at home, being your own herbalist, being your own nutritionist. 
And uh, yeah. The more that we can all learn to take care of ourselves better, we can stay out of the hospitals and take a lot of strain off the system. Totally. I, I'm annoyed at people that have a cold, so they go to an ER. Yeah. You know, there's just so much you should be doing for yourself. Yeah. And that, and that tags a lot of extra strain on the system so that people that are really sick, mm -hmm. you know, I, I remember when I, it was a canoeing mishap years ago where I, I should have, could have, would have drowned. Several people have been killed in this one rapid on the Bow River. And um, anyway, short version of the story was I, I had really mangled uh, this hand. And you see there's one finger that doesn't look quite right there. Um, I think my hand took something like 27 stitches. And uh, when the doctor got to, to this, he said, well, you know, uh, we've got to make a decision here because there's a tiny little bit of nail bed there and I can snip it off right now and you'll just have a nice little round bump. Uh, or uh, if we leave it there, it's going to turn into something. Right. And I said, well, wouldn't it make sense to have something there to protect the finger? So he said, I'm, I'm with you on that. But, but that day, um, uh, the guy I was with in the bow, I just met the night before in a bar in Banff. I'd finished my sales run and I had the canoe on top of the truck and I decided I was going to run the river back home instead of take the truck and come back later with a friend, pick up the truck, whatever. Oh, yeah. And uh, so we'd only known each other for uh, like less than a day. And he was telling me about a trip he'd done on the, um, uh, through the Grand Canyon oh. uh, where somebody had got run in against a, a, a solid wall and they were stupid. You're never supposed to grab the gunnel in difficult situations. You're always holding your paddle. Uh, and and he, his hand was, and he, he, he cut some fingers right off and they were far from any medical attention. Yeah. And uh, one of the guys in, in the group said, well, I'm going to have to burn that, you know, and they, right. they superheated a frying pan and cauterized his wounds. Jeez. So this guy, I had made it through this whole uh, horseshoe steps, it's called. Um, I think it's about a 75 foot drop in a series of steps. So I was tumbling. Uh, it, mm, we were doing something called lining and we didn't know anything about lining. And so the boat got away on us and I, I looked down, he was around the edge of a, of a boulder on the cliff. And I looked down and saw that the canoe was rapidly filling with water and just within seconds, it was gonna be full and just take off like a freight train. And I yelled, let her go. And he was, he, we weren't in sight. He didn't think he heard me right. And I yelled, for F's sakes, let her go. And just in those seconds, the line I was holding, <laughs> around my wrist and yanked me right off this cliff no and I was being pulled underwater uh, hitting rocks and things and whatever Jeez. and uh, it, it was probably a rock yeah. but I came in an eddy at the bottom and uh, he was helping me out of the out of the water and my whole arm was mangled and he said I'm gonna have to burn that you know and I said <laughs> you know like F you, the Foothills Hospital is, is about an hour and a half from here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hike out or whatever and get hitchhike to get to the hospital. And right. you get, you get the gear together as best you can. And, wow. and you know where the truck is. Figure, figure something out. I'm out of here. And there was a very generous man that worked for, um, um, uh, I wanted to say ATCO, I guess. Do they do all the waters and stuff too? they got the gas people. Um, anyway. Um, uh, he was fishing on his day off and saw me coming out of the, the river bank or up the cliff there and said, oh my gosh, I'm going to forget that I'll, I'm going to, I'll drive you to the hospital. So the reason I brought this story up was that I, I was, I, what, he dropped me at the ER and I was standing in this line. Um, all I was wearing was a life jacket and a pair of cutoffs and I had blood all over me. Yeah. And um, my hair had dried in the wind, kind of straight up, <laughs> like something you might do for Halloween. And the line wasn't moving. And I thought, well, a lot of people here don't seem to like. What? Right. what do you have a cold or something? What do you? Yeah, yeah. So, like, so I I'm finally bleeding out here, guys. I, I finally, when somebody was going by with a. Uh, gurney. I finally yelled, excuse me, I think I have a real emergency here. And the woman in front of me turned around with this just bitch face on, like, oh, you think you're more important than I am? But she turned around really close to me and saw all this blood and almost fainted. Like, she, she did scream. She wow. was like, ah! And, and they came and got me on a gurney and got me the heck out of there, right? Wow. But, um, yeah, you know, how many people in that line right. had an emergency? Yeah. You know, I did. Yeah. But um, 
if we all just took a little better care of ourselves, yeah. we'd save the healthcare system a lot of money. Totally. <laughs> but know when this isn't working and when to seek help. Yeah, yeah. Whether it's from you or I or, an, or a, a real doctor or, you know, you need a hospital or something. Yeah. Because we have people that screw around with herbs and they don't take enough or soon enough. Right. You know, the dosage is all wrong. Yeah. And uh, they end up with a pneumonia that can be, um, could end their life. Because mm -hmm. they were just peeing around with herbs. Yeah. They should have gone in sooner or just, they didn't know enough. Yeah. You know, it's, so take some classes, listen to people, read some books, you know, um, um, feel comfortable with what you're doing. And know your limits. Yes. Yeah. That's the point. Yeah, totally. Cool. Well, that's why we call it Wild Wisdom and Storytelling. <laughs> what a story. I haven't heard that one before. And that's why, yeah, sometimes when I'm doing uh, herb walks with children, somebody will say, what, what happened to your hand, Blaine? And yeah. I, I tell them the story about, and sometimes I let, if I don't have this cut, I use um, like electrical side cutters right. to, to trim it. Um, uh, it'll grow quite a bit longer into like a claw. Oh, okay. And um, sometimes when I'm with the kids and I'm telling them the story, if, if, it's, if it's gotten longer, and I said, but it really helps me dig roots and things, you know, as a herbalist. And I, I was actually thinking about getting the other four done. And, so, <laughs> and so, some of the kids go, really? You know, I, no. No. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. But um, it's funny how... I know not that many years ago they would tell us that nerves can't regenerate, like brain cells can't regenerate, and now we know that they can. Like there's been a lot of new discoveries and new thoughts about that. Yeah. But I remember how um, for a long time, I can't remember how long, it might have been a couple of years, the, the, the stump that was there, if I just touched all my fingers, even with a feather, and then with, with a pencil or something, there was no feeling. Right in that fingertip, none at all. I could bang on it and yeah. so it, it used to get cut quite often because I'd be working on the car, reaching up under a dashboard or something and yeah, you'd have hit a no sharp awareness. piece of metal. Yeah. And uh, I would damage it quite often. But after, I don't know how many years, uh, again now, you could just take the lightest feather and it completely regenerated. Oh, amazing. You know, so the mm -hmm. neurons, no, those are just in the brain, what are they called? Axons, I forget, I haven't taught this stuff for a while. Axons. Uh, I don't know, one or the other, but the, the little, um, a nerve cell has a nucleus and then things coming out that are either in your nose to smell stuff. Like, here's one. When, when you smell something, molecules of whether that's a gladiola or dog poop, actual molecules of stuff are coming up into your sinuses yeah. and touching nerve cells. And there's a place there called the cribriform plate. It's a little bony plate. I used to, I found, one day on a hike, I found a, a beaver skull. And I kept it for classes to show students because ours looks the same. It's a little bony plate with little holes. It's sort of like the firewall in your car where the engine and everything's up there. Yeah. But, but wires have to go through and they have uh, grommets on them and stuff, right? So that, you know, if the engine was on fire, you'd be okay, all that story. So it's kind of like the firewall. So you have this thing called the crib reform plate, because if it wasn't there, if you blew your nose really hard, your, your brain would fall out kind <laughs> of thing, right? So little bundles of, um, uh, bundled together, they're called fila, and they go through um, the crib reform plate and directly into your brain. So the, the amazing thing is that those nerve signals travel at 400 feet per second, right? Yeah. And one cell has its hand in the room with us here today, and its left hand is inside the brain. Right. And things are going to move at 400 feet per second. Wow. So when you smell something, like when you read yeah. those things, like aromatherapy is the fastest, most direct route to the brain, that's not fun little gobby, fluffy stuff. That's true. Yeah. You are simultaneously touching the outside world yeah. and your brain with single cells. Wow. Uh, I don't know why that came up, but um, that, yeah. that's true. It's, it's fast. That's fascinating. Right? You know? Yeah. Cool. So, well, let's leave it there for today. That was great. Bid it, bid it, bid it. Wrap it up. Uh, that's all, folks. Thank you all. <laughs>
Yeah, that's all, folks. That's it. <laughs> is that you that used to say that all the time? Or is that Terry? I can't remember. Well, that was Bugs Bunny cartoons. Well, it was, but one of you took that on. I have some vague recollection. Ending, I'm not sure. Ending their lectures, that kind of thing. Anyways, that's all, folks. Bye for See now. you soon.